Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. And here we are with the final episode of Season 28. You know, the year 2020 coincides with the 2500th anniversary of three important ancient battles, one being the Battle of Thermopylae which, coincidentally, was the first episode of Season 1 of the History Network podcast, which Angus and I released some 14 years ago. If you'd like to access those older seasons and original podcasts of ours, all the way up to the current ones, then you could become a patron of the podcast. If you'd like to find out the benefits of becoming a patron, just pop along to patreon.com forward slash the History Network to find out more. The History Network.org podcast, Season 28, Episode 10, The Battle of Stony Point. This episode was written by Sergeant First Class Josh Hollywood Steffens. He is a 15-year combat veteran in the Wisconsin Army National Guard. SFC Steffens was awarded his De Fleury Medal in 2015. Other decorations include the Purple Heart Army Commemoration Medal with V Device, 3rd Award, Army Achievement Medal, 4th Award. Serving as a combat engineer, Hollywood Steffens became fascinated with the engineer regiment and the history of the Corps. In his current role, he stands as a unit historian and platoon sergeant. On the civilian side, he is the owner of Hollywood Powder Company, a small veteran-owned and operated company that sells premium foot and body powder. Hollywood Powder Company was specifically designed for the hard working individual in mind, feel free to visit and follow their Facebook, Instagram and website, hollywoodpowderco.com. July 15th, 1779. The night was dark. The soldiers were ordered to fix bayonets and unload their rifles. Men exhausted, a 14-mile road march in the dead of summer that started at noon got them to this point. Anxiety filled the air as Washington's men set to take back Stony Point. What took 20 minutes left the southern and western and northern flanks of that point covered in blood. General Wayne, commander and organiser of the raid, was shot in the head and still yelled for his troops to push forward. His men selflessly carried him so he could hopefully die still moving into enemy lines. While they crossed the parapets, Lieutenant Colonel de Fleury stood with sword to the sky and British flag under his feet. The fort's our own. This is the story of Stony Point, a little-known battle that revitalised the Revolutionary War and inspires engineers to this day. Lieutenant Colonel François de Fleury's courageous actions during the Battle of Stony Point gave him top accolades from Congress. Although de Fleury was authorised to depart back to France after this battle, he decided to come back and fight with the Americans. He went on to fight at Yorktown in 1781. Every year, engineer soldiers across the regiment awarded the de Fleury Medal. The medal was struck after Lieutenant Colonel François de Fleury, a French aristocrat and chief engineer, who was the first to breach an enemy fortification and was the one who cut down the British flag at Stony Point. Stony Point is a steep, sloped, triangular point pressing into the Hudson River, 30 miles north of New York City, 12 miles south of the West Point. The only entry into the Stony Point is from the west. The two points made a narrow corridor, which was known as the King's Ferry, which was used by both British and Continental soldiers for transporting personnel and supplies. 
With its steep slopes and a 150-foot peak, raiding this point would prove difficult and was known as Little Gibraltar during the time of the battle. The point would be seen as an island with the high tide. With low tide, a marsh surrounded the west side of the point. Today, most of the marsh is dried up. However, it isn't hard to see the former lowlands that gave way to the battle. In May of 1779, by means of the Royal Navy, Lieutenant General Sir Henry Clinton moved up the Hudson River with approximately 6,500 soldiers. Stony Point was currently manned by 35 to 45 Continental soldiers. With the large presence Clinton displayed, the Continental soldiers slipped northwest to avoid confrontation. Stony Point was thus taken by the British. Stony Point proved to be a vital position for Clinton. The extension into the river could easily control the King's Ferry. British commanders felt taking the point would allow them to place cannon fire on Fort Lafayette. In turn, the British would press north to further control the Hudson River. The British now controlled both sides of the Hudson River and first narrow passageway north of Manhattan. Moving northward, Clinton assumed he could apply pressure on Washington and draw the continental south into flatter, more formidable fighting terrain. Clinton was wrong. Lack of supplies and troops due to multiple delays proved Clinton may have bitten off more than he could chew. It was in this narrow window George Washington had to act fast if he wanted to counter. Clinton dispatched upwards of 2,000 of his men from Stony Point to raid local nearby farms and communities, adding to Washington's disgust. They set buildings and farms on fire, terrorising the locals. It was reported that Washington sent spies on multiple occasions into Stony Point, under a truce, to survey the point. When they returned, they spoke of how the British were fortifying the location and advised Washington against an attack. It would lead to a large amount of casualties. Washington was so worried over the findings, he had to reconnoitre the point himself. With a small detail, Washington climbed to the top of Buckberg Mountain, just west of Stony Point, to reconnoitre. Washington called upon General Anthony Wayne to take back Stony Point with the Corps of Light Infantry, Wayne was to do so at midnight at Bayonet Point. Washington had given him a plan and authorised him to modify it where he saw fit. Washington rarely issued an order and allowed subordinated personnel to change it without his approval. This showed an extreme trust and mutual respect in Wayne. The Corps of Light Infantry formed under General Wayne on June 12, 1779, consisted of four regiments two battalions in each, and four companies within the battalions. The 1st Regiment was commanded by Colonel Furbiget, with 2nd in command Lieutenant Colonel de Fleury. The 2nd Regiment was commanded by Colonel Butler, 9th Pennsylvania Regiment. The 3rd Regiment was commanded by Colonel Meigs, 6th Connecticut Regiment. The 4th and final Regiment was commanded by Major Hull. This was newly formed with soldiers from Massachusetts and North Carolina, known later as 8th Massachusetts. With all the troops organised under Wayne, the total force was 1,350 soldiers. Meanwhile, at Stony Point, the 650 British troops garrisoned there continued to dig in. Doctrine at this time stated that 1,350 soldiers would not suffice to take the point with the heavily placed obstacles and steep terrain. Washington planned on hitting the British using one of their famed tactics. The British would often assault during the night with flints removed from rifles and bayonets fixed. This method of removing flints was used so no additional noise was caused by accidents and the attacker would swiftly move into fortifications. Wayne's plan called for a three-pronged attack. Two companies, 150 men, would press forward from the west on the only road to Stony Point. Another small contingent would attack from the north 
Their mission was to lay suppressing fire, a faint attack causing a distraction to the British. They were the only soldiers allowed to have loaded rifles during the operation. Two columns of 700 soldiers, commanded by General Wayne and Lieutenant Colonel de Fleury, would make up the main effort. With fixed bayonets they would wade across the marsh from the south and clear a path through the obstacles with two twenty-man forlorn hope teams. The evening of July 14th, Wayne issued his men a ration of rum and ordered they be clean-shaven and well-powdered for the next morning. Due to the complexity of the operation and nature of the clandestine raid, not many soldiers were aware of the plan. The morning of the 15th, General Wayne readied for inspection. At the strike of noon, the soldiers set out on foot from Fort Montgomery, avoiding the main route to avoid detection. Wayne ordered his men to head down back roads and steep mountain passes to avoid any British traffic. Wayne also ordered his men to take every person they saw into custody and hold them until the operation was complete. General Washington had been adamant about not alerting the British of the attack and maintaining operational security. Around 8pm the Continental troops arrived at a little farmhouse about 1.5 miles west of the point. Wayne had his men fix a white piece of paper to their hats to easily identify his men from opposing forces, limiting any chances of friendly fire casualties. Wayne also offered a bounty of a hundred to five hundred dollars for the first person to breach the inside of the fort. With the sun setting, the wind began to gust, causing British ships to move away from the point and seek calmer waters. At 11pm the soldiers departed for the point. Every column had synced pocket watches, so the attack would begin at midnight. The stage set, Wayne and his men anxiously waited. The stroke of midnight, a British sentry skirmishes back into the fortification as he had seen soldiers approaching from the west. The first shots were fired by Major Hull's 150-man detachment. The British, confused, fired back as Wayne and de Fleury's men began wading across the marsh from the south. Although it was a low tide, the soldiers ended up being waist-deep in water and muck as the British soon began firing on them. They struggled to make it to the shore. Once at the shore, the forlorn hope began cutting the abatis defences away and climbing forward and higher on the banks. As heavy musket fire rained down, General Wayne was struck with the fire. Blood running down his face, he yelled for his men to press forward. A few of his soldiers picked him up and carried him forward up the hill. From a distance he heard, The fort's our own! The attack took just twenty minutes for the colonials to capture the fort. General Wayne survived the attack. He became known as General Mad Antony for his courageous actions. General Mad Antony went on to serve with Washington during his presidency. Lieutenant Colonel de Fleury, Chief of Engineers, would stand before Congress. On October the 1st, 1779, he was praised for his valour at Stony Point by the men who wrote the Declaration of Independence. For his intrepid behaviour, the Continental Congress awarded a medal struck in his honour. In the late 1980s, the Corps of Engineers sought a method to honour significant contributions to the engineer regiment and community. To this day, the de Fleury Medal is awarded from the Army Engineer Association. The de Fleury Medal description is as follows. On the front side of the medal, in Latin, a memorial and reward for courage and boldness. The centre of the medal shows an image of a soldier wearing a helmet, standing amongst rubble, unsheathed sword in right hand, and guidon pole in left, with British flag under his left foot. On the reverse side in Latin, fortifications, marshes, enemies overcome. Centre depicts a fortress with turrets and a flag flying. At the base of the hill are two shore batteries, one battery firing upon the six vessels on the Hudson River. 
on the bottom of the medal Stony Point Carried by Storm, July 15, 1779. And there we leave Season 28. Thank you so much to all of you for being with us throughout the season, especially to all of our patrons who help make this podcast possible. Again, if you'd like to find out about becoming a patron, please just pop along to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash The History Network and find out about the benefits of being a patron there. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast written by Sergeant First Class Josh Hollywood Steffens, read by Nick Barker. <laughs> <laughs>